yeah, so this is obviously not my effectiveness side of things. This is the safety, which is another, my main other area of work. Um, actually, just relating to the previous two um, talks, which, and, and it's quite a nice little example, is my, I've got two oldish teenage daughters now. Both have had the HPV, the vaccine. Uh, the first one had to have it lying down because of the anxiety, exactly as shown on Madhav's slide, um, kind of they started going down, so they just lay them all down. Um, my second daughter, she, she started getting symptoms of, of in the same year as the vaccine of um, whenever she stood up, she felt dizzy and her heart, heart raced, and she was quite um, sporty as well. And I'd been le learning all about POTS this this postural tachycardic syndrome and it looked like it was like lots of those symptoms but I didn't say anything to her along those lines I kept it to myself um but that was a month before she got her HPV vaccine um so it was prior to it but I can just imagine if I did it afterwards having seen everything you know you, you kind of make these connections so I t two interesting HPV um, um examples from my own children um which were quite relevant to my work um so let's get on to population-based surveillance. So this is a kind of um, continuing, really, from some of what Madhavs has talked about and um, and, and is a, a general overview. And we're going to hear more in, I think, the next lecture about a very specific example of the TTS, the throm thrombosis thrombocytopenia. Our aim of this lecture, though, is to understand the role of pharmacovigilance, vaccine pharmacovigilance, um, as well as the epidemiological side, and I kind of focus a little bit more on that, to see how it's done in different settings and to know those designs, and in particular to focus on a method called the self-controlled case series method, which is increasingly used for vaccine safety because it's got some nice benefits. And I'll go into a little bit more detail because you may or may not be so familiar with that method, so I'm going to sort of give a bit of stats because I'm a statistician, so a little bit of stats in this talk as well. Um, now, I've got this slide, which I kind of put together a few years ago, just to remind myself of all the components around vaccine safety. The trials are looking at reactogenicity, and uh, we don't get into that here. They, they will have gone through those early phase trials to, to look at the safety side there. But typically, they're not particularly large, although we do cover an example this afternoon of a pretty large interception rotavirus study. Um, then it, once you go into licensure, you've got your pharmacovigilance. Uh, that's your passive and active and I'll talk about that. You can see our yellow card. That's the UK um, sort of passive system. Um, and that also links into individual causality assessment. And you're going to, well, tomorrow, Madhav's got a more detailed example of that individual side. I don't really think I focus so much on that. I'm looking at the population based. When signals arise, we go through this assessment, uh, strengthening and assessment stage. You can't, you couldn't possibly evaluate in detail every single signal. And there needs to be a certain amount of prioritization, um, plausibility, getting experts involved. And that often the, the those who are evaluating the, the, um, the, the databases would consider the, the importance of the different signals. And there, where there's a priority, they often will go, particularly if it's not totally clear what's going on from that that the, the initial signals, then then you would do epidemiological studies, and you would tend to do them anyway for the important ones. And so we'll talk a little bit about those studies. So starting on the pharmacovigilance, uh, it's the science and activities relating to the detection, assessment, understanding, and prevention and, and communication of adverse events following immunization. And that came from uh, this blueprint um, that goes back to this uh, WHO safety initiative. I've got a link here. I don't know whether in that link they still use the old AEFI definition. So if they do, you need to <laughs> look up the new one that Madhav was talking about. Um, but the important thing is they define these two minimal and, and uh, an enhanced capacity for doing the pharmacovigilance. And really, the idea was that every country should at the very least have this minimal capacity of having reporting forms like those yellow card reports, reforms, healthcare workers and, and others being encouraged to report and use them. So that that knowledge out there to ensure that you get a sufficient level of reporting and then these harmonized methods and tools for monitoring and investigating, which, again, Madhav's covering tomorrow. Um, 
So that's the, the sort of minimal. And then ideally an enhanced capacity, and I'm hoping more and more countries will have this, is to do active surveillance rather than relying on the spontaneous reporting and to do these epidemiological studies to try, try and um, confirm or refute um, uh, hypotheses. Um, on, on methods for detecting signals within your spontaneous reporting system, um, typically this will go through a few stages. Um, there'll be some simple descriptive case counts of the frequencies, trends and spikes in the numbers of reports of the, di of the different, uh, um, they, they tend to get coded up using a coding system, Medra type coding systems, and then they will get looked at in terms of just looking for any spikes. Um, for the very severe events, though, they will get pulled out and individually looked at uh, for clinical review. And, that, and particularly for the severe ones, they might be the ones prioritised to, to, to do the individual assessments. Um, there is also observed versus expected rate. So then some more into the statistical methods where you might compare the number of, of observed adverse events to an external expected source. So, for example, you might have um, back um, some background rates that you've that have been published or that you've look, looked into of these adverse events and there's some papers that have come out in COVID and back to the the H1N1 2009 pandemic of background rates of um, some of the events that are particular interest um, to compare to and you can use that to then work out whether you've seen an, a higher number but of course you know that um, there will be under-reporting of events that come through into any passive system. So often you need to do some fairly crude allowance for under-reporting, like kind of multiplying it up by three or five or ten, um, the number of observed to compare to your expected. So it's not necessarily the best within a passive system. The most common used is, is what's called data mining using a number of different methods. The most common is disproportionately an, a disproportionality analysis. And here, what they, you do is you compare the proportion of events after one vaccine to maybe all other vaccines, but perhaps given in a similar age. Tricky if they're all given con exactly the same time. But um, if that's not the case, then you can do that comparison. So for MMR, for example, you might have more uh, proportionally more convulsions reported um, than you do for other vaccines. Once you take into account all the reports given for MMR and all the reports given to the, for the other vaccines, so in this case, it might be that 40% of all adverse events after MMR are convulsions compared to 20% for others, and that would be a ratio of two. And that can be checked statistically using simple chi-squared type analyses, um, allowing for the fact that you're doing lots of tests to come up with signals. So that's disproportionality. Um, and, and, but I, I should say there are other, other methods as well, more advanced methods for kind of looking through that, that, uh, that, those data. Um, Active surveillance then gets into using large linked databases in a routine um, and rapid way to try to identify signals. Um, now, the, there's a number of systems out that are being used. For example, the Vaccine Safety Data Link in the USA and PRISM. They will monitor a number of adverse events of interest. Usually requires specifying events of interest that you're going to particularly follow rather than trying to cover everything. Um, in Israel, in, for COVID, they had a, a system using the Kalit Health Services. In the UK, we set up a system particularly for the, pan, for the COVID using our clinical practice research data link. Um, also use that for maternal pus, pertussis, trying in reasonable real time, but there is always more delays in these systems to, to, to detect events. In Canada, they do have an a active system of reporting um, in called the IMPACT system, and that in, involves um, pediatric tertiary care beds and monitoring of, of, the, uh, of children who get admitted for any potential adverse events. So that's more of an individual biological plausibility active surveillance. Um, more recently, um, active surveillance in cohorts has been done, such as in Australia using SMS texting, um, setting, having a number of a few thousand individuals who'll be asked to report back every few days um, of any symptoms that they've had. Um, and that's been set up also in other in countries following COVID of, of particular cohorts. There is still a question there of what's your comparator. You can compare different vaccines, for example, but there isn't an unvaccinated comparator there. Um, and there's a templates for cohort event monitoring, again, by setting up cohorts to monitor. And that's been 
um, up the templates being created by WHO for doing that, particularly for COVID. Um, what methods are used for detecting signals in these databases? The usual current methodology is you start with a list of events of interest, and there's typically around 30, 40 or so events that have been identified as of interest because other vaccines have had those, those um, adverse ev events being shown to be causal or likely to be causal, or are there of interest because maybe they, the disease itself is known to cause them, particularly for live vaccines. You might think that maybe some of these events could be of interest for, the, for a live vaccine. Um, and so they tend to get put together as, as, a, as a list from various sources of those of particular interest. But it's, it's not usually huge numbers. Um, and then what's done is once you've got that list, you can clearly interrogate your databases, um, your, your healthcare, usually electronic healthcare databases, and compare the cumulative reports coming into those databases with a comparison group, which could be the historical incidents. So what was the incidence last year? And are we now seeing a higher incidence um, following vaccination? Um, uh, now we've introduced a, a new vaccine. It could be that we try to rapidly construct a concurrent unvaccinated group. So you're comparing in real time vaccinated and unvaccinated, almost like setting up a little cohort that you're monitoring quickly. Or you can do self-controlled methods. And I'll get into the self-controlled case series design where you might looking within individuals and comparing the number of events in maybe two different intervals after vaccination. And in fact, the US have implemented that method in their rapid cycle analysis for COVID. Um, the statistical method used when you're doing these analyses, having to maybe look at them every single week, is um, often called a sequential monitoring method or sequential probability ratio tests, because you're doing lots of multiple hypothesis testing and you have to control your type 2 error so you don't have too many false signals. And that can be done statistically. You can work out the, the way of doing that when you're running those. In the future, will there be scanning of events Multi, many hundreds and thousands of potential events in multiple data sources using artificial intelligence. There probably will be. I'm concerned about quite how that works. Neural networks don't tell you about causality, so will they, will they really help? Because you won't really know why. You'll just know there's a signal. Um, I'm interested to how that go, how that how that progresses. I'm keeping an eye on it. If anyone knows of things that I don't know about, do come and tell me because I haven't found something that seems to be currently in active use that's kind of working in that way. Um, as an example of a rapid cycle outcome that has been assessed uh, in during COVID, these were 23 events that in the US they were looking in their, their, um, their vaccine safety data link. Um, I've highlighted the myocarditis, uh, pericarditis example there because that's one that did flag up. Um, and they were comparing the number of events in a certain interval, 1 to 21, with 22 to 42 days after vaccination. And, they, and, and what they did do was that they did find a signal. I think for most of the others, they didn't. I can see thrombos thrombosis with thrombocytopenia is there, but they don't think they were using um, the, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. So I don't think they signaled there. Um, but for myocarditis, pericarditis, they did signal with a rate ratio of 1.72. So they had 1.7 times as many cases in the 1 to 21 day as the 22 to 42 day period. And that signaled P less than 0 0.001 and led to further studies and, and further assessment. Uh, more recently, they did have a signal with stroke um, and the bivalent vaccines and We've invested, and, but that signal actually disappeared eventually over time. They recently updated that, um, that, that assessment, but we did do some studies looking at that without seeing anything. So that's um, examples of this of passive and active surveillance. There's pros and cons of the two. Um, passive is rapid. Usually it can be the whole population, and, and the reports can come from many sources. Anyone can often report in. Um, however, it will have under-reporting. And is subject to biases like media. If there's been a lot of media attention, you'll get more of, more of the reports coming in of a particular adverse event. And there's no unvaccinated comparator. So in general, it is only signal generation. Um, active generally does have more delays because usually the information is having to come into a 
an electronic database unless you're doing this SMS type um, database of a, of a cohort where you're rapidly getting in, uh, them to provide information. Often not the whole population because that often isn't available. Um, and it's usually a more restricted events of interest, but it does have less bias. And in many of the active surveillance, there is a, this unvaccinated or comparator or a comparator that is another time point after vaccination, um, allowing you to be more confident that a signal might be true. Um, you do have a little bit careful if you're if you're using the databases that you might want to do an epi study in, you might be on a little bit careful that. If you signal in that entire database and then want to go back and test the signal, if you're reusing the same data, you might just find the same signal again and think you're, you're sort of, and, and that's not a true validation. So you'd be a little bit careful whether you use up all your data. Um, there's many other sources of safety signals than the, than the, um, these active and passive surveillance. There's individual case reports that might come from medical specialists. Most of these will probably be false signals, but for some true ones that do come through. Um, there'll be events of interest from clinical trials, which may not have shown a statistically significant difference, but may have been, there may have been a difference that, that was indicated that they should be looked at. Um, I'm thinking here into susception in the Rota Shield vaccine. They did have, I think, two versus seven cases. So seven in the vaccinated, two in the unvaccinated. And I think that was kind of noted as something to keep an eye on. The biological mechanism of the, particularly for live vaccines might be relevant. Ecological studies, if particularly if you're using a, doing a vaccine campaign with a huge number of vaccines given in a very short period of time, if there happens to be a, sp a spike of a particular um, ev event that could be of interest, that might be evidence of something to look at. Um, reports from other countries using whatever methods they use is probably the most common reason that I find I'm ending up looking at um, signals because they may have picked something up that we didn't and in particular in Scandinavia they seem to be good at finding signals um <laughs> certainly the narcolepsy came from there and that was from from medical specialists and then that getting noticed quickly by the the um the the, the, the health professionals there right so what you've got you've got a signal what do you do next um well rapidly you need to look at that signal and explore other data sets ask experts and those in other countries using the same vaccines and ideally you should be reporting it to somebody so that others know about it as well um, and this rapid assessment might enable you to dismiss the signal you might find a good reason why that signals occurred uh, and or why it is not something to be concerned about um, but it might be on the other hand so convincing that you can take action immediately um, or it might lead to further studies to try to decide whether there really is a true um, the signal really, really is, in, is an, an issue that needs to be seen as a, a true adverse event, a true adverse reaction. Um, you have to prioritize because, um, you know, there may be many signals and you have to decide which ones are important. And that will, re that will relate to whether the vaccine is still being used, how serious it is. Um, whether it's affecting coverage and so on. Um, if you're going to do an epi study, you need to refine your question. So often a signal is quite general. You need to decide what exactly is the um, event, what's the case definition. This is where Brighton case definitions can become very useful. Um, and, and, and also um, uh, the, the, is it which is the exact vaccine, which is the dose and so on. And then you test using epi studies. So sometimes signal assessment stage is enough and you're going to hear about the rare blood clots um, and thrombocytopenia later. I won't talk too much about that, but uh, the, that came through very quickly and was such a specific um, condition and event. So let's talk about that specificity that um, action could be taken in this case before full epi studies were done from the signals. Epidemiological assessment. There's cohort case control designs which a uh, similar use of these designs to any other epidemiological study you might do. So I'm not going to spend time going through what would typically be a cohort, which often would be a retrospective cohort using electronic data or a case control where you might try and find your um, cases, your adverse event cases, and then compare to a control group. I'll focus on the self-controlled case series because I think you may be less familiar. There's also a method called case coverage that we've used in the UK comparing overall uptake in cases to the um, population uptake. And that's another way 
to, to uh, identify associations. And we actually use that with narcolepsy and pandemic vaccines. So which design do we use and, um, uh, and um, uh, you know, which would be the best design? Well, that, that will depend on the exact question, the data sources and likely confounding variables. And there's usually a trade off between the ideal and the practical. So what you have to consider is what are all my data sources? Where's the what, immunization registries, disease registries, hospital data, um, general practice data? Can you link these together? And when you've linked them, what type of study design would fit for doing that analysis? And so it depends on those sources and the data, how you can link the data together, and whether you can create cohorts or you need to do case control. Um, but in but in practice, often, particularly where there's clustering of events post-vaccination, the self-control case series is an excellent method. Back, developed back in 92 at the UK HSA by Paddy Farrington, who was some predecessor in my job. And they've written a very nice book about it, which, um, you know, if you ever want to use this, me, me, what is worth getting. Um, and also there's a great tutorial paper by Whitaker and all at all, at all to look at, which is a bit shorter. So how does it work? Have an observation period. Typically, that could be a period in time or it could be the first year of life in an infant. And you look at what time the vaccine's given and you'll have a risk period that needs to be defined based on maybe talking to experts, maybe on some of the data that's come through from the signal generation that you think that any adverse events might occur in. You might have a later period after that where you think there may be some residual risk. And then the rest of the time in black is your control comparator. And you might have some age boundaries to allow for time varying variables, given if, if the adverse event changes by age or time. So those boundaries are chopping up your person time to allow for that. So the, you've got your control periods. And what you do with this is you, you will have an event that occurs in one of those periods. And I put an X. It's, a, it's occurred in the vaccine period. So sometime in that period, there will be an event because you're only using individuals who've had an event in that observation period. So those events, the X's could fall in the control periods or in the periods after vaccination. And what you then do is you chop up all your person time that's shown above uh, at each stage um, from this is between the first year of life in the second year of life. You actually chop up the length of each of those intervals um, and each into each. And, and then whether or not someone's in the control period or the vaccine periods, you count your person time, you count your events. And it's a bit like doing a cohort study in that respect, but within individuals. So you'll have your person time and your events. And you can analyze it in Stata by a conditional pass on model. This is the little bit of statistics. So you have your number of events. You fit a conditional pass on model. You allow for your exposure, that's the vaccine and your age groups. Um, you, you, you stratify by individual and you adjust for the length of time, each individual, each of, of the length of each of those intervals. So what does it, what is the good about this? What's good about this method? It's the follow up is not censored at the event, at the event. So you actually always use the entire follow up. Um, it's good for independent recurrent events or non or uncommon non recurrent events. So you can have a single event or you can actually use something like convul something like convulsions. You may have multiple events. You can have more than one event per individual. And it only uses cases. Those cases mustn't be a collection of cases. They've got to be a random unbiased set and it's self matched. And the great thing about the method is it eliminates con factors that the confounding factors that don't change over time. So it's automatically controls for things like ethnicity, frailty, gender. That doesn't need to be considered. And that's a big plus of the method because it's within cases. But you can't use the method if it affects vaccination. If it, if, if, if it actually affects, if having the event can affect you getting vaccinated, you can typically only use post-vaccination person time. You can't use that time period before. Because if you had the event and that's a contraindication, you're never going to get vaccinated. So you won't when you look at your data, you won't see any events before your vaccine's given. But you can just use post vaccination time or adapt it. It can't be used when all the events are after the exposure. So long term development problems after an infant vaccination. Um, and if the event, if the vaccine triggers events that would have happened anyway, so it makes a clustering, you're going to pick up a signal. I can see the times. Is that correct? OK, I need to keep going. Right. That's fine. Yeah, I, I'll I'll, uh, I'll give you your examples quite quickly because there, there, there's some nice examples using only cases. Um, 
what we found is if you compare to a cohort study, it's incredibly efficient. You've got two studies here, a cohort and a case series that found the same pretty much or similar risks after, of convulsions after MMR, similar confidence intervals, but you can do it on much smaller numbers. It's also great for adjust, allowing for confounding. There was a study of exas, um, asthma exacerbation and flu. And uh, what we found was that um, the cohort unadjusted suggested there was a, a risk of the flu vaccine to, to cause asthma exacerbations. But with a cohort study, when they did their adjustments, it came down. But you can still still significant when they did it within just the cases that significance disappeared altogether. And, and that was thought to be due to indication bias and the, the methods not affected by that. We did an example with rotavirus, and, and you can, we can hear about rotavirus and intersusception. Um, and this was an analysis we did in the UK, where we identified hospital episode statistic data um, for a period of time, 2013 to 2014, and we captured vaccination history from GPs. Um, we got the diagnosis confirmed by Brighton criteria, and we used the method, and we did an adjustment for age with two-week intervals. And we saw pretty clearly, at least with a monovalent vaccine, that there was a cluster after the first dose and a lesser cluster after the second dose. And so we did see an increased incidence in our monovalent vaccine in the UK. And it was a very rapid way of doing this analysis. Um, we've already heard about causality. I, I picked tempor temporality, strength of association and consistency as the ones that I think about most. I haven't got the... Um, uh, the, the specificity here, because I don't think it's always totally specific and an adverse event to a vaccine. But those are the ones I think are most important. And what the example that's quite nice you've already seen is when it comes at least to uh, the pandemic vaccine. And you've seen these already. We do have clear strength of association, high risks, consistency between studies. And the temporality isn't really shown here. But it's three out of four stars in that it, or three out of five stars in that it's, it's a longer interval that narcolepsy is generally seen over. It doesn't cluster in a few weeks, but when we looked at it in a few years after vaccination, when we did an updated analysis, you could see that increased risk dropped off after about two years. Um, there's a few networks of global, uh, global safety networks that I mentioned here that are worth looking, looking into and, and very useful collaborations because vaccines are global, vaccine safety is global. Talking to other countries, knowing what they're looking at is really important. And so we're connected in with the Global Vaccine Data Network. There's a project in Europe, vac for eu and all the world WHO Global Vaccine Safety Initiatives, which are really helpful to have. So in summary, pharmacovigilance and individual causality they help identify signals and rapidly assess them, but you need these population-based studies to um, are very important for assessing that causality. Um, and the optimal design will depend on that question and the data sources you have, um, but the self-controlled case series often is a great design for anything that sort of has clustering. And I think going forward, more and more large linked databases are going to be available in many more countries. So using those further is, is going to be really important in, in more countries. So I think that was my last slide. Yes, I've had bonus slides, but I won't go into those. I'll finish there. You can look at those in your, on your own time. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, for a very, very good <laughs> lecture today. Um, I have a question for sure. because you sort of skipped over it. You you asked yourself which method is best, yes. cohort, uh, case control, etc. Uh, which one would you choose if you have the option? I I would choose uh, in any event which is um, that tends to be fairly a cause in a fairly acute way. Um, I, so typically within weeks or month or, 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 or maybe what, you know, within a few months, um, the self-controlled case series is, I think, the best method in the vast majority of situations because it has that, it deals with that individual level confounding, which is hard to often address in other studies because of who might be targeted. So it deals with the, the, the fact that risk groups might have been more targeted with a COVID vaccine, for example, and they might be more at risk of these adverse events. That's all controlled within the method of um, self-controlled case series. So in many examples, that, that would be my sort of first thought is self-controlled case series. 
But there are there are situations where you've got an event that could occur in a very long window after vaccination where that wouldn't be appropriate, at which point I would secondly go to cohort um, and then thirdly, probably to, to thinking, is there a way of doing a case control study bearing in all the minds of control selection problems? Um, so those three, although I, I mentioned this case coverage method that we use for narcolepsy, that was an alternative design that used the fact we had good population data on coverage that we could stratify by lots of variables. And that enabled us to match each case to a population coverage contra type control, which worked very well. So, yeah, self-controlled case here is generally the best, but don't always assume it would work. Yeah. Thanks. Please, questions. Yes. Thanks. That was really interesting. Um, but going back probably quite some way here. Yeah. The countries that have really weak or essentially non-existent surveillance systems, um, which is probably relevant to quite a few of us in the room, um, what would you say like the absolute priorities when we're not going to get 30 or 40 events, we're not going to have electronic registries, but like what would be the few things that we should be focusing on as we're trying to implement these systems? I mean, for me, the whether you, in terms of having some sort of system in place, I think having a number of hospitals, for example, which are capable of where you do set something up within those smaller number of hospitals for at least within those being able to identify um, events of interest um, would be the first thing I would think of starting. Try and get some of the larger hospitals um, up and running, um, identifying events, whether whether that's, you know, whether that's in, in their own within hospital electronic system or, or even if it's um, some other sort of paper based reporting system or reporting system you set up, I would. I would think in terms of being able to do the epidemiological assessments and the, and the active surveillance, having even just a few hospitals often is a good starting point, plus maybe networking with some other countries who are also maybe doing the same to call. So you get your power from, a, from having a few different countries able to do that. So I, I would have thought having that set up, I know if it's in Africa, is, is Avrak, Avrak, is it the, the right name for the, the, the committees that, that are involved in Africa? If there's a new vaccine that comes into, like the malaria vaccine, to a few different countries, having that in place would be helpful. Yeah. But the really rare events, it's always going to be difficult. Yes, please. Uh Thank you for your great presentation. Uh, suppose that for a manufacturer uh, that is doing pharmacovigilance studies, okay, and among that, uh, one person dies. So what is the condition for the recall? Maybe the uh, casualty assessment must be done, or, for example, the recall batch must be done. What is the condition about that? I mean, the good example that with that one was the the girl that was shown with the HPV vaccine who died in the UK, I think on the day or the next day of vaccination, you really, this is where you need that rapid individual level causality assessment to be done without panicking at a sort of at your um, country level uh, public health institute, you know, regulatory side at the same time, but having um, processes in place to be able to quickly look that's where having the yellow cards or, or your pharmacovigilance database to quickly look for other events that are the same quick uh, is essential. I did a very rapid observed expected analysis on that, on the deaths. How many deaths did we expect to occur on the same or within a day or two of vaccination? And I showed that actually one by chance, one probably was going to go occur during our campaign. Um, so having that initial holding response whilst that individual assessment's going on is essential to stop you essentially causing the whole program to collapse over one case. Um, so yeah, you need to be quick and ready to communicate. I think it took about 28 hours or so. Before, yeah. Or so you, you, we saw the headlines one yeah. day and the next day, uh, new headlines. Came. Yeah. They, 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 they did. Uh, yeah. They did rush through the, um, to find the condition that she, that this this girl had around the heart defects, yes, yeah. Please. 
All right. Thank you so much. Um, my question is related to risk communication when you do get a signal. Yeah. So, you know, with COVID, there were numerous uh, safety signals, some very clear, like TTS, where you could act on. But you did mention like the stroke signal with the bivalent yeah. laser, for example, where it was not very clear and it was going to take a while to generate the evidence. So I think in those situations, there's always this tension between transparency and releasing that info to the public and doing communication around that versus waiting till you have a little bit more information to, you know, go on. And yeah. I think in the situation of Pfizer, ultimately it didn't really pan out, but you know, that message was already seeded into the minds of the public. So I'm just wondering your thoughts on how to balance the risk communications when you do get a statistical signal that still needs to be worked up a little bit further. I mean, I, I definitely think that particularly from the passive surveillance type reporting and, and also the active, having that put into the public is kind of part of that information being out there. It's, I think that's good to do, but you need to be very, very careful about the way that you interpret those initial signals and the communication that comes with it. And I probably would have been a bit more cautious myself than in terms of the way I'd have communicated that than... Um, CDC was it? <laughs> yeah, the, the, they they did it because I immediately looked at it and was thinking that looks like a false positive. But um, yeah, initially I think you've got to be really careful in 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 when it's coming out of um, your pharmacovigilance, even if it is within the rapid cycle analysis where it's a fewer events. I still think that needs to be very very cautiously explained, even though that's hard. It has that's you know you've got to say look, this is really just a signal. Most signals are false. We're going to do as quickly as we can further assessment. Actually, we were able to, in the UK, look at that signal within a few days um, and communicate it to uh, the MHRA. We've got a, the papers just accepted now for that, which is obviously quite a long time later for, for it being from our side. That's the first thing that's going to be in the public domain, which, which is maybe is a bit slow um, as, as an evaluation. But yeah. That's it's got to be careful communication and and being particularly on signals coming out down initially, generally downplaying them unless it is something as clear cut as the TTS, which did become clear cut very quickly. So uh, CDC clearly reached out to the, to the world. Yes. Uh, and uh, many responded. So I know Denmark, Finland, Denmark and did. UK. Yes, and we and part of the vaccine safety data net, we we three countries quickly put some information together, which then went to WHO as well. I think it got that that those quick assessments to sort of say we're not seeing it here. Yeah, and 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 I think even within on the on the page on uh, in where they say about the signal, they do talk about it not being seen in some of the other data sources. Yeah. So lots of experience have been gained during COVID-19. Yeah, the that more it happens. That us going forward. Yeah. I think we need to learn. The more we're getting, the more those signals do go out into the public, the more we need to learn about how to, how to communicate them as well so they don't have a detrimental effect when they shouldn't. Please. Great lecture. Uh, I'd just like to um, ask about the self-controlled case series. Yeah. Um, how do you choose the optimal length of the window period to maximize the accuracy and, you know, precision of the association between the event and the outcome? So the, the way it's always worked when I've done many of these studies is we get someone who's an expert on that particular event. Um, and so there is a, bio, they then will consider if, if it's biologically plausible, what would the window be? And at the same time, we will look at the um, adverse events that have been reported, what's the timing? Now, typically they will cluster towards the time of the vaccination because by definition, your adverse events in a passive system will be reported soon. Um, so our usual, we, get, we come up with a maximum window where we think if it's going to be biologically plausibly related in a short period of time, then this window should capture them all. So you kind of err on the side of longer window but then you can't make it so long that you don't end up, you, then you have to wait too long to have control periods, particularly if you can't use control periods prior to vaccination. So there is a bit of to and fro with the experts on picking that. And often we have two windows, the shorter one that we think is the most high, likely, and then a, what you might call a washout period a little bit later before we go into the control. But yeah, that is always the hardest one to answer because I always get asked that, how do you decide? And it is, 
often on sort of the plausibility of an association that that's chosen. Yeah. So almost at the window, okay. Cerise. <laughs> yes, please. Thank you so much. Um, you were talking about the future and, and the importance of linked databases. And I think we in the room always agree uh, on that. But in Belgium, where I work, whenever we want to link health data, there is a lot of um, pushback from the privacy authorities. And so, I was, and we look very enviously at the, <laughs> at the UK. So I was wondering, is there, did you do any communication towards the public around it? Is it or is it just generally accepted and you just got lucky? I mean, you can opt out, but only a few percent, like through two or three percent in the UK do opt out of having their information used. So we wouldn't be able to use that information. That wouldn't even be available to us if people opt out of having that data shared. Otherwise, we don't get too much resistance, but that the resistance. But one of the one of the things that um, is a potential solution here is I don't. We have something called Open Safely that was a large GP data set that was be, that was set up in the pandemic. That does everything remotely, so you program everything up, set, send it off to the um, remote environment for the analyses to be done, and then they you just get your results back so that that keeps all the um, anonymous data at, at the secure site um, and if it so I would say if there's a problem if, if there's a problem with that then that's that's going to become increasingly used as a as a way of doing lots of our epi analyses we kind of got to get used to that remote environment I, I struggle a bit with it because I'd like to be like really deep inside the data and feel I understand it well and that it kind of you lose a bit of that but I think that we do need to get used to that way of working. So, yeah, the open, safely type um, remote environment might be a way around it. Yeah. So, please. Um, you mentioned that um, in the passive case, I mean, the passive case could be rapid. So I'm trying to think how, because as, um, how can a rapid is Passive surveillance be rapid. Is it in terms of the reporting? Is it in terms of the analysis? It's, it's is... rapid in in that the data comes through should come through quickly. In that as soon as somebody, I mean, if someone has that adverse event and contacts a health professional, they should be remediate sort of pretty much well straight immediately reporting that into your system. So as long as your system is capable of having that feed through quickly. You will know about that event often, you know, within a few days of a day or two, it will get into your system to an analyze and you and you should be that the analysis should be happening every few days or every day or week at the worst. So that the time interval between the adverse event and you analyzing it should be very short. The problem with using a lot of the the, the active, particularly where they're using electronic health databases, is that usually the delays can be more can run into weeks particularly for a hospitalization event they've got to be discharged the letter goes to their gp say it's going to get entered and then that data has to be available that that can often put in the cpd that our, our clinical practice research database which is a gp one that often puts like three four five weeks delay um, into the system but these the passive ideally should be quick if it's not that's not an ideal passive system and it probably needs to be looked at to see if it can be sped up. So at EMA, the, at the European Medicines Agency, there is an algorithm that runs through the passive reporting system about once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so if there's a little cluster, they will pick it up uh, from that algorithm uh, running constantly almost. Usually weekly or even daily if on a new vaccine, perhaps. Yeah. Mm. This, so this is true for the Western setting. It's true for Western set, setting, um, and you know, and there's there's obviously the the uh, so the the WHO globally reported in system. What's that called again? <laughs> Upsala monitoring, Upsala monitoring centre. But again, that will rely on how quickly it gets reported in. You're probably you're probably right that not every country has that rapid. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, the rapid attainment of those reports. Um, so maybe not as rapid as I was claiming if that, if there are delays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think I see Camille here. So I think we should thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. For a wonderful lecture.